Thank you very much. It's great to be here. For more than a decade, the United States and other countries around the world have been waging a so-called war on terror. From almost every aspect, this war has been an unmitigated disaster. And for many in the United States and other countries, the result has been a feeling that they are viewed as a potential enemy simply because of their faith. It is time, past time, to call attention to the problems and hardships that blaming terrorism on Islam has caused. We can think of the thousands and thousands in our country and in the West pulled out for random screenings at airports in front of their families, or profiled at traffic stops, or accosted on the street. It is important to acknowledge the social costs and curtailed civil liberties these misguided policies have caused. We as a society and as a world know better. We can do better. It is incumbent upon us to strive toward, not run away, rigorous analysis. To discover the true face of terrorism instead of depending on lazy stereotypes. And finally, to educate all around us in order to exit this vicious cycle of harming innocence while doing nothing to stop real terrorism. <laughs> Thank you. I am speaking of a return to justice in our dealing with the Muslim world. In order to achieve that justice, we need more knowledge. To do so, we need to ask hard questions and examine the answers honestly, even if it seems counterintuitive. There hangs above this whole debate one question. Could the war on terror actually be creating more terrorists? Since 9-11, the United States has invaded and directly occupied two Muslim countries, Iraq and Afghanistan, indirectly occupied a third, Pakistan, and sent thousands of special forces around the world to hunt out terrorists. Has this made us any safer? That is a question that we know the answer to, but we need facts, hard facts, not just for us, so that we can tell and persuade others. We and others can no longer say we don't have time to find out the facts. Even during the Bush era, the American Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, once asked the question, are we producing more terrorists than we're killing? That question needs to be answered with hard data. And the research I've been conducting is hard data right on that topic. And th thank you. <laughs> that research, it may come as a surprise to hear, has been funded by the U.S. Department of Defense, the Pentagon. And actually has some adherents I'll tell you about in just a moment. Um, it's summarized in my books. It's summarized online for free. You don't have to pay to get the basic facts. But let me tell you what the study has been about. It's been about suicide terrorism, the form of terrorism that's the most deadly and the most associated with Islam in the public's mind. And I've looked at every suicide attack over the last 30 years. Here's the reality. In 2000, the year before 
there were 20 suicide attacks around the world. One was anti-American against the coal in Yemen. In 2009, there were 300 suicide attacks around the world, over 250 anti-American inspired. Our policies are not stopping terror. We're doing more to scare Americans and good Muslims in the West than the terrorists. And these policies created ISIS, the problem that we have. It is clear we need to move beyond the war on terror. And tonight, I would like to ask you to join a growing movement to do just that. To enable this move, it is crucial to change the public debate away from the false reality that Islam is causing terrorism. That can be done with new knowledge, new facts that paint a fundamentally different picture, and if you help, you can help disseminate this knowledge. Shortly after 9-11, I compiled a database of roughly 350 suicide attacks what I found was stunning. Half of those attacks were not associated with Islamic fundamentalism. The world leader during that period, 25 years, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka weren't even Muslims. They were Hindus. They were secular. They were anti-religious. What I found was that it's not religion driving suicide attack, any religion. What I found is that over 95% of suicide attacks are in direct response to a military occupation. And I don't mean occupation in some trivial sense. Let me give you one example. Before the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in June of 1982, Hezbollah did not exist. One month later, after 78,000 Israeli combat soldiers invaded and occupied the country, Hezbollah was born, and suicide attacks began shortly thereafter. Those attacks continued for nearly 20 years until Israel military troops left the country. And from the time they left until the war, most recent war with Syria, no suicide attacks by Hezbollah on Israel. The rise and that fantastic decline of suicide attacks shows a strong relationship with suicide terrorism and occupation. So it should come as no surprise in 2003, when the Americans occupied Iraq, we produced the largest suicide campaign in history. Then American troops left, and what did we leave behind? A government we installed to even more occupy the Sunni community. And we created ISIS, and left behind the government we installed to further motivate ISIS. This is not winning the war on terror. As you know, many today in the United States and around the world, on the right and the left, are calling for more combat troops in Muslim countries. They need to hear this message. They need to hear these facts. And here's why. For those who turn to terrorism, occupation is not just a grievance, like many old grievances. It's a deep moral harm. Experiencing this occupation allows terrorist leaders to reframe murder and suicide as justified acts of self-defense. And if that occupation continues or grows, you're not changing 
that outcome. We are not effectively addressing this reality. We are not even getting accurate pictures of suicide attackers. I've studied 462 suicide attackers, the largest de demographic profile. They are not poor, uneducated, unemployed. They are more educated than their surrounding community. Working class, middle class, they are teachers, ambulance drivers, security guards, the kind of people who you would think would care about their communities and fight for self-defense. Spreading this wealth of new information is precisely what could allow us to turn away from the harmful policies that have caused more terrorism than it has stopped and to build new policies that would uproot terrorism instead of planting new seeds for more. For those who think progress can't be made, it's important to know that our efforts are making headway. Our voices are being heard. One of the biggest advocates of these policies sits in the Oval Office. He is turning the tide, but we still have a long way to go to truly move the world beyond the war on terror, we need your help. What's necessary is a true culture of change, to move public discussion away from harmful assumptions to facts, to balance out the thousands of mistaken public discussions about why Islam causes terrorism with real facts about terrorism, and not to be afraid of talking about terrorism. You are all influential, academic, political, secular leaders in your community. You are also vibrant members of your community. I ask you here tonight to commit to spreading the truth and these facts about what caused terrorism to your colleagues, to your congregants, to your friends, and to your families. If each of you would simply talk to three people and tell them about these facts, three people, and ask those three people to talk to three people, and ask those three people to talk to three people, the 10,000 of you, in short order, could fundamentally change the world. And it's changing the public that we need to do. And you are the engine of that change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.